Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on as a service offerings brought to you by Insight Cloud and Data Center Transformation. I'm Jessica Ostring, Marketing Specialist at Insight, and will be your moderator today. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or remove any of the windows that you have open. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. All questions from this webcast will be captured. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the question mark icon below at the presenter window. The help guide covers common technical issues. I would now like to turn the presentation over to our presenters, Kent Christensen and Jason Diaz. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jessica. Um, my name is Kent Christensen, um, and I guess we'll start out by saying what is cloud data center transformation within Insight. Uh, Insight's a, a fairly large organization. We have different areas of specialization, uh, one of them being digital innovation, which is kind of more your software, your AI, things like that, um, you know, digital edge, things like that. A connected workforce would be, you know, we're all trying to get a more connected workforce, so devices, um, you know, Microsoft solutions, et cetera. Um, cloud data center transformation, kind of as the name sounds, uh, the transformation of data center strategies, cloud strategies, et cetera. So we really appreciate you taking the time um, to talk about consumption models. This is something that has been slowly emerging over a few years and really aggressively um, accelerating over the last, I'd say, two years, a year and a half specifically. Um, the different consumption models, and we'll, we'll walk through this, and, and um, Insight has made major investments. If you start looking at, and we'll talk about some of the partners, the OEMs that are in this market in a big way, uh, they've been investing in us because we were well positioned to do this. Um, so we do believe we're well positioned to consult with you on what it is. Um, I end up doing this multiple times a day, and most organizations that are getting an understanding of what is this new consumption model and how might it impact my business. Really appreciate it, so we hope you do too. Um, and it's it's really just information to say there are different ways to look at the world. Um, it isn't just cloud or CapEx in a data center, but this hybrid is really starting to evolve. Um, so that's our goal, is to educate you, we'll not talk about specific solutions. We're available to talk in much, much detail about all of the specific solutions. So we'll mention some of the big ones we're working with. Uh, so let's step back and look at the market. Um, as I mentioned, we have been working with many, many um, OEMs uh, for actually a few years, and some of them were you know, really slow to uptake, um, although we had some very large clients, as, as Jason's well aware, um, taking a consumption model or an as-a-service model. So we can just look at how Gartner looked at this. And by the end of 2019, before any of this, um, you know, recent uh, pandemic, et cetera, happened to the to the world and the market, um, et cetera, they said, you know, it's only been 1% of the market to this point, but we see a real acceleration to 50% over the next 18 months. Well, the next 18 months, you know, really leading up to right now, had a lot of change in the world. Um, and one of the things that changed is, is our view and their view on how fast this is going to happen. So by March of this year, they came back and said, it's not 15%, it's not 20%, it's 40 to 70% of especially storage. But they're really saying in some of the other reports, the, the 40 to 50% of all infrastructure would be consumed as a consumption model. Um, and really what they're saying here is because CapEx is very difficult to manage. It's all we knew to consume data center infrastructure. You either CapEx or data center, or you OpEx or cloud. Um, but when you think about it, if you have another option, many people say this CapEx model is a barrier to my innovation. It's difficult to lifecycle hardware and run a business at the same time. And so really we're seeing that as a breakthrough. We're hearing that from the clients, et cetera. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at that um, from how we see it, um, you know, this whole concept of cloud is, you know, um, you know, very evolving. Um, and we've seen this for years and years and years, and we've helped people walk through this. But, the, you know, I think a couple of years ago, people were like, well, I'm either on-prem or I'm going all cloud. Uh, maybe hybrid has uh, some of each. Um, and now what the world is saying is there's more ways to solve for this. 
Um, if I were to just summarize in one sentence what as a service is, it is I can bring cloud consumption to you. You don't need to go into an external public cloud to get some of the benefits of a consumption model that have some of the attributes of cloud. And so in a way, what all of these have in common when we talk about as a service is how can I consume infrastructure that sits in my data center or in a hosted data center like I would consume cloud services, giving me more choices. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so that is what's growing. That is what's getting a lot of clients. We're seeing massive, massive growth in our customer base. We wanted to share with you. This is really just a brief flyover slide that says, you know, a lot of organizations, we are not negative on public cloud. Um, matter of fact, that whole digital innovation is pretty much focused 100% on public cloud applications. But what it's simply saying is a lot of organizations or initiatives within an organization are perfectly set for public cloud, and that is really the only way to accomplish them. You can't create the next Uber or Netflix or in this case Dropbox or anything by building massive data centers when you're growing at a thousand percent and trying to go public at multi multiple billion dollar valuations. However, what it's saying in this article is once you get to a point where your your growth is um, you know double digits or, or below um, even up to triple digits, it then becomes a drag. They call it a trillion dollar paradox. And this is really what we want to do. Not saying what's the right solution, because the right solution, whether it's cloud, hybrid, or or, or data center, et cetera, absolutely depends on your environment and your business model. This is just saying that some people got in there and realized that, well, in order to keep my earnings um, at any growth, I need to, you know, kind of, um, measure some of that investment in public cloud. So, um, we, we've talked to a lot of clients. Um, Jason's going to, you know, Jason's one of our awesome architects um, in the southeast, uh, working with those clients. Um, I work with them on many. He's going to go through these, but let's summarize over dozens and dozens of clients why they're doing this. There is a subset of clients, some of them public sector to balance budgets. Some of them in distressed industries, think of an airline, think of a hotel, think of other industries that have been under stress, that say this is really a financial tool. It can absolutely be a financial tool to say, I'm not going to overpay, I'm not going to pay up front, I'm going to pay for what I use. Um, and that could just be purely, is this more financially appealing? However, we're going to go through a couple of examples that says, well, there's other reasons and maybe they're more important. Um, one organization we're going to talk about is a large, very, very secure, large financial, and they have a cloud strategy, and it's a very, very aggressive public cloud strategy. And what they're doing, and we'll talk, we'll talk about it, is this is a bridge to cloud. We don't know if we're going to have X amount of things in the cloud over Y amount of time, and X and Y are unknown. Uh, there's targets, but they're completely unknown. And so what they're doing is putting massive quantities of, of their infrastructure into as a service, at which point, at some point, they can move pieces of that to public cloud. So it's a bridge to cloud strategy taking risk on an overall cloud strategy. And the other is simply most people, especially in storage, when you start planning three or four years out, start to think about, oh my gosh, you know, I got to make this big decision. Either infrastructure is old and I'm starting to feel at risk, um, especially with aging infrastructure, Operationally, but now securely, you know, is that is that a burden to me? Um, so a lot of people are trying to figure out life cycle events and things like that. And when they start planning, having the ability to just use what you need now, um, grow as you need, shrink if you need, you know, et cetera, uh, takes risk out of that planning. So, you know, again, we don't have time in this session, but we'll absolutely, if you're interested in specific organizations, et cetera, that do this, um, go through the specific offerings that they have and how we deliver them. We'll touch base on, on some of that. The one thing I would say is pretty much everybody who wants to sell you something for a data center um, is going to offer it as a service now. Whether they're mature at doing that or not mature at doing that is really dependent completely on the organization. What we do is because they're all calling us knowing that we can deliver this, um, is we break them into two groups. One is what I call service-based pricing. It says, do you have a rate card? Is it published? Does the consumer of your services, because we can certainly go to cloud and figure out how much something is in cloud, 
can I look at your rate card and figure out if I wanted terabytes of storage or compute nodes or whatever? Can I understand what that offering is and how much it costs? Or on the other side, what we call configuration-based, are you really going to configure some hardware and then come back and give me a price that looks like it has a service model? Depending on your organization, if you put that specific hardware configuration into an agreement that's as a service, some organizations say, well, that, according to FASB, is a lease. Um, some say, nope, because I'm paying you know, an OPEX cost, it's not. Um, that's really up to every individual organization, um, but we certainly see the benefit of the transparency of service-based pricing. So just quickly, some of the clients we work with, um, you know, the storage providers, NetApp, uh, Peer Storage, HPE, GreenLake. Um, now we're seeing um, Dell with Apex coming in with um, as-a-service models. Um, Cisco, if you, if you look, Cisco, we were the first partner in um, with them. Um, in the compute, obviously, HPE, Dell, um, some of the, obviously, the cloud providers have always been as a service in some of the data protection. So a lot to offer. Um, we'll cover more of that. Um, but with that, Jason, um, we had a financial that, you know, again, about a year and a half ago called us up and said, well, because we're going to cloud, we're not going to buy any more infrastructure. In this case, they're a large user of NetApp. Jason, you want to talk about, you know, how we've uh, rolled that out with them? Yeah, um, before I do that, I'm going to go back a slide and just kind of uh, highlight one element that, that I think we're, we're discussing at a high level, and, and that's life cycle. So how many folks on this call have acquired, uh, you know, large storage arrays or 58 servers to run this particular set of VMs and, and whatnot, you know, and then you deploy it and all of a sudden you find yourself utilizing 40% of the memory or 40% of the CPU assets um, and maybe 50% of the storage. And you did that, right, uh, either through some intelligent decision-making to keep yourself, uh, you know, in, with a healthy amount of uh, scaling room, or perhaps it was oversized and you didn't do any detailed analysis as to what you actually needed, right? Um, and everybody falls victim to both of those. Um, <clears throat> With the as a service model, we take a measurement of what you actually use, both consumption in the CPU and in the compute layer, consumption in the storage layer, size it up by 30%, ship it. You use, right? And when you hit certain thresholds, because the OEMs and, and ourselves are uh, collecting consumption metrics on a, on a weekly or a monthly basis, and, you know, for the purposes of billing, when you hit a certain threshold that may get you near a best practice violation from a utilization perspective, Within the terms of the program, new stuff is just shipped out, installed, free of charge. You don't have to go get quotes for additional shelves or capacity or servers and all that kind of stuff. It's baked into the program, program to, to expand. And to be honest, the OEMs want that to happen, right? Because the more you consume, the bigger the bill is. Um, so it, it really allows you to right size to your, you know, use case and your use level and then incrementally apply uh, scale as needed based on the, the um, either weekly or monthly uh, consumption metering. I think that's a big component. That's a value add that you no longer have to um, address scale and go out and continue to acquire capital assets to expand the compute environment, expand the storage environment. It's just kind of all baked in as is the support of the equipment and the software related. Um, so there's no more, you know, negotiating support, support contracts, reviewing support contracts to see whether, you know, you're in violation of whatever. Um, all that all that stuff just kind of goes away, right? And that's one of the typical challenges of life cycle, right, um, is, is the scaling aspect and support. And then eventually those CapEx purchases, whether it's storage, compute, what, what have you, networking, they start to reach an age, right? Three years after purchase, right? We're all familiar with the, the next support renewal. And then you start thinking in terms of, okay, should I renew or should I refresh? Um, <clears throat> it's a big bill to renew. It's an even more big bill to refresh, all that kind of stuff. That stuff goes away, right? Because you're no longer dealing with support contract. And, uh, you know, with some of the storage vendors, depending on the terms of the program that the OEM offers, um, 
they throw in like a storage controller upgrade at the third year or fourth year or something like that to make sure that you're always running on the modern platform as long as you're part of the program. Um, so it, it, if there's any questions on that, uh, kind of, that's kind of the low levels of, of, you know, how the program works from a lifecycle perspective. Any questions on that, throw them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll proceed. Uh, no, that's a great point, Jason, just to jump in. the um, We've heard from a m number of major uh, organizations and up to CIOs, they want completely out of the hardware lifecycle business, which is an awesome way to summarize what you just said. Yeah, and that, that's one of, the, one of the leading motivators to, you know, going to the cloud. Um, they don't want to deal with that stuff anymore. So if you could provide an as-a-service model that operates financially and scaling wise like the cloud does dynamic scaling and adding more resources as needed drawing back on resources as your consumption needs go down um, <clears throat> then we're basically bringing the financial and life cycle um, uh, values of cloud to your on-prem data center right and we're not here suggesting you go everything 100 percent back on prem and everything we realize that everybody's going to end up in some kind of hybrid flavor if you, you know leveraging one or two, maybe more public clouds, but also on-prem data centers. And <clears throat> the vision here is, you know, for that hybrid environment, you know, you, you get one financial model, one life cycle management model that basically is non-life cycle management. And it looks the same on both ends from a financial perspective as well as scalability issue or scalability perspective and all that stuff. So. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch on that, and like I said, if there's any questions, throw them in the chat window on that. Uh, and, and we'll be happy to uh, get, get into a more detailed discussion on the, the, the uniqueness of each OEM program and how that how they handle system upgrades or adding components to the service and, and all that kind of stuff. We don't have the time to get into the each OEM at this point. But the case study we wanted to kind of share with you, as Kent mentioned, is uh, a very large financial company. Um, not going to get into what they do because you'd probably be able to figure out who it is and, and uh, we want to protect their privacy. Um, so they had a long history with NetApp Storage um, and I worked with them for decades as one of my colleague, colleagues has who's not here. Um, <clears throat> and they made an, an executive level decision to uh, move uh, a large amount of their stuff into public cloud, AWS and Google. And they made major commitments as far as spend rate and all that kind of junk um, with those providers, but they didn't have any kind of insight into how long it was going to take, how are we going to do this, all, all, all that stuff. All at the same time, a lot of their aging infrastructure was reaching those things I just mentioned. It's time to renew, time to refresh, all that kind of stuff. And what they found was they given the executive level initiative for public cloud, they had a hard time getting, getting uh, CapEx uh, budget approved to replace infrastructure that would ultimately reside in the data center for the next five years because of the cloud vision. So <clears throat> we brought the concept of NetApp Keystone, which is their as a service offering, right? And this enabled them to get basically all new NetApp gear and pay for it on a consumption basis on a uh, minimum term of one year, NetApp offers one to five years as, as a minimum term. Obviously, the more years, the higher the discount rate per terabyte. But this fit very well into their, we'll call it unknown strategy as far as how long it was going to take them to get to the cloud, you know, 100% or 90% or whatever rate, rate they were planning to take there. So this is a perfect blending of the challenge of dealing with refreshes and renewals and all that kind of stuff on aging NetApp assets. Um, and running into roadblocks, getting capital, you know, expenditures approved because of the vision to go to the cloud. So this gave them a, a, a runway, if you will, where, you know, we deploy three petabytes, with, you know, pick a number, and over the next three years, as, as they start to develop a strategy to move to the cloud, they migrate into the cloud, right? Um, and then their consumption of that three petabytes goes down to two petabytes, and then over the term of the contract, the idea was that, that they're paying on a per, per, per terabyte basis on, and on a monthly basis, that number should start to go down, go down, go down, go down, while the cloud bill goes up and up and up as that migration occurs. So it was a great financial bridge and a great hurdle um, 
to, to get over uh, a great way to get over the hurdle of not getting any capex approvals for infrastructure that was you know wanted for the data center that, that they had to buy honestly they had any in, in service life issues coming up on their environment all that kind of stuff so this was the perfect tool for them um it, you you take away all of those financial challenges and, and all that kind of stuff and you really look at the other value components it brought uh, most of the storage vendors we deal with, the storage areas we deal with, have some flavor of integration into the cloud and with the cloud. So what this particular use case brought to them was NetApp can run all day long, uh, you know, under the operating system, system on tap in the cloud, which gave them a tool for migrating data, right? So they could uh, use a, a tool called SnapNear, which is a NetApp product. To basically migrate from NetApp to NetApp, and the, and the targeted NetApp system was running in the cloud, so that became a valuable tool for them to move data as they uh, began their journey. Right, so that was just a, a total win for them, and, and they've actually come back and, and uh, deployed this more than we initially anticipated, and uh, we're deploying it in multiple locations right now. So. That was a, a really good uh, case for us. That was a really good win for us, and it certainly worked uh, very well for the customer, given the challenges they had. Um, moving on from a case study, th this is um, kind of sort of a, a real life case study where <clears throat> we, a customer was kind of, you know, this is going to lead into the next case study I'm going to talk about, but. We wanted to do a measurement of, you know, what does it cost to run as a service now? Um, data center as a service, which we call it FlexBot or any of the converged architectures, which is inclusive of switching, storage, compute, all that kind of stuff to run virtual machines, which is, you know, 90% of the, the workloads in, in most data centers. What does it cost to move 500 beams to the cloud? Or what does it cost to build a reference architecture such as a FlexBot? with the right number of servers, uh, with the right CPU spec, with the right RAM spec. And so we took an industry average across a bunch of different clients to kind of come up with uh, the CPU and, and, and RAM uh, averages on a per VM basis, right? These are gonna vary, uh, of course, in every environment, but this was kind of a rolled up average for the CPU, 14 gigs of RAM, 400 gigs of storage. So given that, with a, 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 a VM count of 500, we designed the compute, the networking, and the storage requirements that would be required to support this with the comfortable overhead, and came up with a per month rate that equated to a nine cents per VM per hour rate. Now, when you compare that to AWS EC2, uh, M5 DX large, whatever, it's 22, 23 cents an hour. Of course, that's going to vary too because there's minimum, you know, there, there's there's contractual things that, that most customers set up that, that drive, you know, deeper discounts with the provider. I think this was a standard discount, uh, but as you can see there, that that's a drastically different number, nine cents versus 20, 23 cents per VM per hour, right? And so the message there is unless there's an absolute, you know, executive initiative or whatever, you must go to the cloud where you're absolutely getting out of the data center business, all that kind of stuff. Consider this because sometimes we can build this, right? And, and like I said, a lot, a lot of these variables um, may be different in your environment or in other environments, but the message here is that this can actually be done much cheaper in the cloud. Um, one of the motivating factors of cloud also, outside of the life cycle support and all that junk, is the um, the agility that the cloud supposedly brings, right? And that agility is only as good as the team that are operating the cloud and and, and building automation tools. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cover that in just a few minutes. But this right here speaks volumes um, in terms of how much money you could potentially save if you do this on prem under and as a service model. And just like the cloud, these programs allow you to scale up and scale down and your bill changes every month depending on, you know, which way you're going. Um, that's very similar to how the cloud allows you to burst or shrink back down or whatever or move certain assets to another cloud, which drives your, 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 your first cloud vendor's bill down a little bit. So it's just dynamic in terms of what your bill's going to look like, and it's directly tied to what you're consuming, right, which is what everybody wants. No more buying, you know, 50 of these when you only need 38 of them, right? 
Yeah, Jason, this is um, that was that's an example. We built those models, and you can look at those. And there's different, you know, art and OEMs in there to go and say, well, what would it cost? And then, you know, in this case, we we went and applied it to a real customer. So if you want to um, go through that quickly, and then we'll try to get to some of the automation stuff. Yeah. Um, by the way, we built these models not just for uh, the standard VM, but also for VDI databases, et cetera. So um, information that we can provide for you. Yeah, that, that's. I, I got about six different slides that look like this that are measuring VDI, uh, VM counts up to a thousand, VM counts up to four thousand, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we we have this breakdown for many different use cases. It, we don't have time to go through them all in, in this session. So if there are follow-ups where we need to kind of go through that, go through the detail of what a, what the utility and program uh, looks like. Set it up with Tammy or set it up with your Kent, and we'll be happy to host that. All right. So the the use case, uh, second case study use case, whatever um, we wanted to call out was specific to uh, the last slide you saw where we broke it down on for VM hour, right? Um, and they had the you know the, the sweet spot for as a service they had aging technology. You know, that, that's where, you know, it gets into the things I was mentioning earlier about life cycle, refresh, and support, all that kind of stuff. And they wanted to align their infrastructure to their actual consumption versus having, you know, 10 times what they or five times what they actually needed. Um, and so we basically delivered FlexPod as a service, uh, you know, to the, to the point of the last slide at a lower cost when compared to um, cloud. We delivered this at a lower cost, which allowed them to stay on prem, which I think is what they preferred. Um, if anything, it allowed it, it allowed them to take more time uh, and, and use this as a bridge to the cloud, right? So, anything else to cover from this case study, Ken? Yeah, no, the, I think this is another example where the client, before making a big decision to choose cloud or not to cloud, and, and in this case, Microsoft was in there providing incentives to go to public cloud. And we just collected data on their specific environment, leveraging the models. Then we said, okay, well, it looks like, you know, and it was confirmed by the cloud provider that public cloud would actually cost you, you know, almost three times what it would do to kind of just go to an as a service model. What's important here is for the first time you can compare nine cents per hour with, you know, 22 cents per hour or whatever that is. Whereas if you're trying to compare a data center, cloud strategy with an OPEX or a data center, you know, CAPEX strategy or with OPEX strategy, it was very difficult and it got lost in politics, et cetera. So um, try to wrap this up for you and, and get a little bit on the automation. You know, so what we're doing is we're offering um, what we'll call a service model to wrap around these as a service model. So we're mentioning different OEMs that provide theirs, whether it's Keystone from NetApp or Peers of Service or Dell Apex or Cisco Plus. One of the things that's consistent is we always include what we call our essential services. That not only allows us to help you proactively manage it, um, manage the subscription, but it also is allowing us to consolidate billing. So we can put, you know, in the case of a, of a FlexPod, you know, hey, there's a little bit of Cisco, there's a little bit of NetApp, um, there might be some cloud, we can put that all together and provide it to you. Now, optionally, people are saying, well, some, and it's less than, than you know, um, 20 or 30 percent say, I want you to operate it as well. Um, so we can actually operate it for you, put it in a hosted environment, and give you the, the, the total comparison. So, you know, just concluding that, um, what we're seeing, and you're seeing a couple of case studies where both of them said, I'm starting to think about storage, and then they expanded. I need to think about my compute. How do I merge that with my cloud? How do I do my data protection, the security? And that's what we're able to do is wrap those all into a single solution. Um, and Jason, maybe with a, a little bit of time left, um, we can talk about, you know, we can also help you automate some of that. Yeah, so this, we have two, you know, initiatives internally that are very critical to our customers. Um, one of them being, I mean, there's another, uh, a number of initiatives, but I'm focusing on two here, right? One is how do we pull off the financial model of the cloud while remaining on prem? That's what this whole as a service thing is, right? We've kind of touched on the why and, and how it works and all that kind of stuff a little bit through this. But what good is all of that if we don't give you agility? If we don't give you the, uh, the you know, the, the, 
the other motivating factor, one of the big motivating factors of, of cloud migration is the quote unquote agility and the, and, and the, the, the ability to be more dynamic, right? Versus working in a siloed infrastructure where you got to wait on network guy to do this or, you know, VM where person to do that, uh, server guy to do that and storage guy to do this, right? Uh, <clears throat> that has been a huge obstacle to innovation and modern, modern, modernization efforts for as long as I can remember. Um, so folks say, we don't need to deal with that anymore, right? We just, we, we want a SQL server. We want 14 app servers stood up, right? Why does it take, you know, 68 days and change control and all that kind of stuff to do that? Um, and, and then came the cloud. And that got a lot better. It didn't get uh, to where it could be because at the time, automation tools were, were relatively lacking. Fast forward to today, and we have tools like Ansible, and you know, there's 58,000 of these things, right? If you look at our automation slide, there's uh, you know hundreds of, of, of tools at your disposal, um, and, and the, the idea is, you know, if, if we bring the as a service financial model at a cheaper rate to run your workload on prem, and we add automation on top of that to um, <clears throat> to help you be more dynamic, to help you be more agile, and we build out the, the, the workflows and all that kind of stuff and, and all the automation components and, and uh, um, workbooks and all that kind of stuff to where when your organization needs to deploy those 14 application servers, you just basically push a button, right? And all the, the gizmos under the covers execute for you. And, you know, there's going to be some approval workflow, all that kind of stuff. It, it's all an automated process. But bringing this as a service model to where you pay for it financially like you do the cloud and folding in automation capabilities on top of that is really kind of delivering the cloud experience right on prem both financially and operationally and that's really where we're trying to go with all this right the, the as a service thing is cool it's awesome it, it you know gets you out of the whole life cycle management stuff and um, gets you away from support removals and all that kind of stuff but we haven't solved for agility and that's where we uh, tap into our automation team, which we have a dedicated team stood up just for this, and they could work with a, a number of different Tom Hearns on this call. Um, he can't speak, I don't think, but um, if we need to have a, a follow-up session, um, he's got all the knowledge on that piece. Um, we'll be happy to, to have a session on that. But the idea is to couple this as a service thing and the automation capabilities and, and enable you to be as, as agile, if not more, uh, in your data center or as agile covering a hybrid cloud. So you want to stand up 14 application server in Google, go for it, hit that button. You want to stand up 14 app servers on prem on your as a service infrastructure, hit that button, go for it. So bringing that agility that you get in cloud to your entire hybrid operation with these as a service models really is going to give you the best, you know, um, hybrid cloud experience and you're going to have a consistent look, build, deployment model, tool set, et cetera, et cetera, and financial model across the entire hybrid spectrum, okay? So some of our capabilities in automation, right, that I mentioned there's a gazillion different tools that you can tap into for automation. But in, in the container world, right, we, we deal with Tanzu, NSX, OpenShift. I don't know if any of you guys are, are on a container journey or not. Um, most customers, customers we find are, are very immature in this area. Um, some are much more mature than, than others, of course. But, you know, we can help you with containerization using the, the, the usual Kubernetes deployments, um, <clears throat> which, again, drives agility and drives, you know, um, mobility. So in, in, a, in a true hybrid operation, you know, you can move containers, you know, from a public cloud into an on-prem infrastructure all that kind of stuff so we can help with that side and then obviously uh, the automation tools uh, and the technologies that we have built automation around um, are Ansible, Terraform, you know there, there's five or six more that we're, that we're really good at and we have built Ansible playbooks and, and uh, automation capabilities around Cisco, Palo Alto, F5, NetApp, Dell, VMware you know, Apache, Isilon, all that kind of stuff. 
So there really isn't, it, as long as it, as long as it has an API or a way to remotely do something, we can deal with just about any technology that you throw in front of us as far as being able to automate the deployment of a workflow, work, workload, a VM, a database, and what have you. So from the technology perspective, you see that this is anybody and everybody, right? Um, we can use these tools, these automation tools to tap in and execute things such as, you know, give me storage, give me a VM, give me 14 VMs, give me, give me three SQL databases, et cetera, et cetera, to basically deliver that agility that you hope to get out of the cloud, but I, I would guess that relatively, uh, uh, you would probably rarely achieve what you thought you were going to achieve there. And that, awesome. that's it. Um, we, we have nine well, minutes. No, I think, thank you, Jason. I don't know if anybody feels comfortable putting anything in the Q&A, um, but, you know, really the next step is is if, if there's something like of interest, um, you probably all know who Tammy is. Um, she can get you into a deep dive. You know, really just to summarize, um, we are seeing and the industry is seeing a rapid adoption of these solutions. It's all over public sector. It's all over small to large organizations saying, hey, there's this new model that might be right for me. We're not saying everybody wants to do it, but we're saying a large majority of people absolutely want to know how this can impact their business. Um, they are very appealing. Um, as we gave a couple of examples, sometimes they can actually be very appealing um, in a public cloud strategy, even if it's all public cloud, this can be an accent or part of a hybrid strategy. Um, and I guess the last thing, you know, if the message um, that Insight was kind of, if you would, built to deliver these. And so everybody who is coming out with a strategy, and if you start to look at the people that have launched their strategies publicly, and you can see it on their website at NetApp and Pure, and you're going to hear things from HPE and Dell, and certainly Cisco is public about the fact that they're working with us. And so, um, you know, a large organization could call every OEM and say, come and tell me your story, but I think we're in an awesome position to work and help you understand these and what solutions might meet your particular goals, because that's really our interest. So um, I think with that, Jason, I think these were great examples, um, a bit of a lot of information in a short amount of time. Hopefully, it creates follow-up questions um, on your part um, to follow up with this. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share um, while well, we, we have a few minutes left. Um, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm working on two things for, for two different customers, and, and I, I have, you know, I kind of, I've kind of rolled up, you know, who I think is right for these as a service models. Um, we, we kind of torn through some of that, but I'll just give you two real life examples that I'm actively working on right now. And um, one of them, actually is both of them, so I'll summarize. They are at year three, year four on existing storage assets, right? Um, they're running Cisco, I don't know if you know, M3, M4, and M6 series servers. Um, they're running M3 and M4 servers, so they're hitting end of support life on much of their compute and storage infrastructure, right? They can continue to get another year of support out of it because the POSL doesn't come up until 2000, early 2023. Um, <clears throat> so they're looking at fairly steep uh, support renewals on those things. And they said, okay, well, what if we swap this? What if we do head swaps? What if we do infrastructure, you know, refresh, all that kind of stuff? All right, well, it's going to be a big bill because we can't head swap because this particular disk in that system that you bought seven, eight years ago um, will not operate on the code version that the newer platforms run, run at, right? So you just kind of got multiple technology challenges in terms of, you know, uh, bulking together a system refresh to, you know, get more support out of it, all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's another way to do this. Here's all net new, brand new. We put it on the floor, we plug it into your cluster, we move the data over um, seamlessly, and you pay based on, you know, what you're consuming right now so much per month. Um, and that just seemed like the cleanest and most e and easiest approach to take 
versus trying to continue to bleed these things for all they can through support renewals and, you know, tech refreshing the components that need tech re refresh rather than a brand new system because they don't have capital for that. And, um, I mean, both cases that I'm working on right now are in that situation and they are absolutely ideal candidates. And we did a, uh, PCO measurement to see, okay, if they renew this thing for another year and then they do refresh after support life ends and all that kind of stuff, um, it's going to cost them this much over the next four years. If we just send them a brand new unit tomorrow under the as a service program, it's going to cost this much per month. And guess what? That much per month times 48 months, the four year mark, the actual total cost of ownership was in their favor to go as a service. And it was such a, it, it, it's a much easier approach to everything. So that erases what they had already budgeted for um, support renewal to carry them through the next year. And that erases the uh, budget request for CapEx dollars to um, to purchase refresh assets next year. Uh, both cases are very similar. Both cases carried an, an equivalent TCO um, when you measure it over the next three years or four years. And it worked out in their favor, both from uh, uh, ease of pulling it off and simplicity perspective, but also a total cost of ownership over the next three or four years perspective. So great. They're probably going to pursue that path. They have to work with their financial side of the organization on how they capitalize assets. All that kind of, I'm the technical dude. I don't get into those conversations, but they got to, they got to get through the financial, uh, you know, hurdles with the CFO and all that kind of stuff to make sure it's, it's okay with them. Um, but it is a absolute turnkey, easy way to get out of that whole thing we talked about. And the TCO suggests that it's in their favor, not by a whole lot, but it's in their favor to, to go that route. And if they do that at year four, which is where we're measuring TCO, we would likely be up against the same challenge of renewing or refreshing again, because we'd be three years into the life cycle on a new system. And so, um, long term, that TCO gets even better because they don't have to at year four go get capital dollars again to do a refresh all that kind of stuff. So, I just th those are two real life use cases that I'm actually running right now, and I thought it would be worth uh, throwing it, throw, throwing it, that out to the, to the group here. So, with that, we had three minutes, two and a half minutes. Um, if anybody wants to put anything in the chat as far as questions or follow ups you may want. Please do so. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, maybe people are shouted to the public, like questions publicly. We're absolutely happy to talk to you. Um, but those are great examples. We're seeing in the public sector that you know um, budgets are uncertain. Um, some of the federal and state um, and public entities are really adopting this model, quite frankly, faster than some of the commercials. Commercial organizations, it's a new new way to do something. So the financial we were talking about, it took them nine months to just, it seemed like a good idea, but to get used to the idea. And once they said, okay, let's try this here, um, it became a standard. Um, and now we're on the fifth um, consumption. So, you know, I think that's the biggest challenge is understanding does this model help you um, meet your transformational and business objectives? If so, let's help you understand in more detail how they, how that can happen. Um, and, um, you know, what we're seeing is absolutely 100% of the people that started down this path they have grown and adopted more. So um, I think, Jason, with that, thank you for your expertise in, in the clients. Um, you are local to the people at this call. Um, and we look forward to um, hopefully following up. And, and Tammy's a good uh, conduit to get you to to more information if needed. Yeah, and, and for the folks still on, thank you for your time. Thanks for getting on to listen to us. And we certainly appreciate it. Thank you for attending today's webcast. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available within two to three days. You will receive an email notification once the recording is available. Thank you again for participating in today's webcast. Yeah, thank you.